Thank you for standing by. I am Emma, your chorus call operator. Welcome and thank you for joining the Zim Q1 2021 Financial Results Conference Call. Throughout today's recorded presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. The presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, you may press star followed by one on your touchtone telephone. Press the star key followed by zero for operator assistance. I would now like to turn the conference over to Alana Holtzman, Head of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Emma, and welcome to Zim's first quarter 2021 Financial Results Conference Call. Joining me on the call today are Eli Glickman, Zim's President and CEO, and Xavier Destriou, Zim's CFO. Before we begin, I would like to remind you that during the course of this call, we will make forward-looking statements regarding expectations, predictions, projections, or future events or results. We believe that our expectations and assumptions are reasonable. We wish to caution you that such statements reflect only the company's current expectations and that actual events or results may differ, including materially. You are kindly referred to consider the risk factors and cautionary language described in the documents the company filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including our 2020 annual report filed on Form 20F on March 22nd, 2021. We undertake no obligation to update these forward-looking statements. At this time, I would like to turn the call over to Eli Glickman. Eli? Thank you, Ilana, and welcome to today's call. It is truly a momentous time in Zim 75-year history. I'm excited to share with you our impressive year-to-date accomplishment, as well as the important steps we've taken to unlock significant shareholder value. Following our successful IPO to become the first global container liner, liner to list in the United States, we have continued our strong trajectory which, which we outline on slide number four. First, our differentiated approach and the proactive strategy we implemented to capitalize on the highly attractive market have once again produced record results. For the second consecutive quarter, we generated all-time record EBITDA and net profit. With net profit for Q1 2021, higher than for the full year of 2020. Again, net profit for Q1 2021, higher than for the full year of 2020. We are pleased to report that our consistent earning growth positions Zim as one of the leading carriers in terms of profitability. We also deliver our highest operating cash flow ever of $777 million. Notably, our Q1 2021 EBIT in EBITDA results were well above the implied guidance range that we provided in March 2021. Importantly, we continue to deliver industry-leading margins and once again outperform the liner industry average. Our just EBITDA margin was our highest ever, 47%, again 47%, and a just EBIT margin was also our highest ever, 39%, again 39%. We remain committed to our goal of consistently performing as one of the top three carriers in terms of EBIT margin. We also significantly strengthen our balance sheet, and today our shareholder equity is more than $1 billion. Based on our strong first quarter performance, the robust market environment, and the full completion of our freight contracts at higher rates, which we will discuss later, we are raising our 2021 guidance, specifically 
we now expect to generate 2021 EBITDA between 2.5 to 2.8 billion dollar and EBIT between 1.85 to 2.15 billion dollar. This is up from our March 21 exceptional of EBITDA in the range of 1.4 to 1.6 billion dollar and EBIT in a range of 850 million to 1.05 billion dollar. Our record result in the first quarter enable us to achieve another important milestone for the shareholders. Based on our strong cash flow in Q1, we will redeem in the entire $340 million principal amount outstanding on our Series 1 and 2 notes, eliminating the restriction we faced on paying a dividend on account of 2020 profits. We are proud to achieve this important accomplishment sooner than expected and earlier than the stated maturity by two all years, further strengthening our balance sheet and enhancing Zin's position to take advantage of favorable fundamentals for the benefit of shareholders. As a result, and taking into consideration our improved outlook that is, a, that is even better than we previously anticipated, as well as our success capitalizing on the attractive market, we are pleased to announce that our board of directors approved distribu the distribution of a special dividend of approximately $240 million, or $2 per share in 2021. Importantly, this special dividend come on top of our previously communicated 2021 annual dividend guidance, whereby we are expecting to be distributing between 30 to 50% of 2021 net income in 2022. Our first quarter financial results reflect our consistent earning growth, and as I already mentioned, are well above the implied guidance we provided last quarter. As you can see on slide number five, our leverage continued to trend down, downward. Zim's net, net leverage improved from 5.3 to 0 0.5 over the previous nine quarters, positioning us in the top tier of the industry. Sustainable growth remains a top priority for Zim, and we remain focused on being one of the top three players in terms of EBIT margin among the global carriers. Moving to the next slide, slide number six, we made significant progress here to date advancing major initiatives with notable achievement related to our four strategic pillars, operational and commercial agility, operational excellence, and leading innovation and digitalization in shipping industry. First, for Zim, our exceptional operational agilities allow us to successfully compete with global shipping giants as we implement our differentiated asset light and global niche model. The benefits of this approach were demonstrated as we had adapted our vessel deployment to address dramatic change in the demand since early 2020 in response to the COVID and the subsequent recovery in demand. Prior, excuse me, prior to COVID, our fleet includes 68 vessels, which we count down to 59 in May of 2020. As global trade resumed and caught up to pre-pandemic levels, we identified new opportunities and expanded our capacity, growing our fleet to 98 vessels as mid-March. Today, 
Our fleet includes over 110 vessels. As we continue to quickly align our capacity in the past few months to meet continued growth in demand, despite the very tight chartering market. Related to our success in increasing our capacity, we drew on our commercial agility to identify market opportunities and develop new growth engines. Importantly, we expand in our strategic Pacific and intra-Asia trades, opening new services to address profitable underserved routes. In 2020, we identified the opportunity for premium high-speed services to meet growing e-commerce trends and provide viable shipping alternative to air freight. In the first quarter of 2021, we launched additional lines to meet growing acceptance of this offering. This e-commerce services, including three from Asia to the U.S. West Coast, are instrumental in driving our record Q1 results and positive forward output. Through our partnership with the 2M Alliance, American MSC will further strengthen our Trans-Pacific presence, a key trade for us launching an eight joint Asia U.S. East Coast Line service to commence this month. In addition, we have worked with our partners to upgrade our Asia to the U.S. Gulf Coast Line service by upsizing vessel capacity. Another of Zim's primary strengths is our operational excellence. A key component of this sustainability we are committed to responsible corporate citizenship with a particular focus on implementing policies and initiatives that help mitigate the impact of our operation on our planet. Consistent with this critical objective, we move quickly, as promised, in our IPO roadshow, and two weeks after pricing, we announced the conclusion of a strategic long-term charter agreement with CISPAN. In February, we announced for 10 green 15,000 TU LNG dual fuel vessels. We are proud that this transaction will position Zim as a leader in terms of carbon intensity among global liners. Other key features of our operational excellence include our continued emphasis on effectively managing costs and our equipment needs. Given our significant growth, combined with the current congested market and limited availability of containers, we have made substantial investment in new equipment, already starting in 2020, to best position Zim for the future. Since January 1st, we have entered into agreement for the purchase of containers, mostly new built units, for a total of approximately $588 million, and will grow our container fleet from approximately 640,000 TU as of the end of March 2020 to exceed 900,000 TU at year end to both meet our growing business and address challenges caused by port congestion. Finally, we have continued to invest in disruptive technology, further establishing Zim as a leading digital shipping company. In March, we announced our participation in the Series B financing round of WaveBL, a developer of groundbreaking blockchain-based platform supporting paperless trend in the shipping industry. We view our early investment in WaveBL in 2017 as a major win, as our objective since inception was foster border industry adoption. We are delighted to see the growing acceptance of wave technology, including by other global carriers. Most recently, we established Zimar, a tech company that we expect will revolutionize scanning based on its colorful market long-grade scanning capabilities and ability to scan multiple items simultaneously. 
We are excited about Zimmer's potential to impact shipping and broader logistics sector. Consistent with landmark innovation, they will transform other industry. We are proud of the progress we have made renovating Zim as a resilient and robust digital shipping company that utilizes sophisticated digital strategies to power new services and build opportunities for our customers. I will now turn the call over to Xavier, our CFO, for his comment on our financial results and market development. Please. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. And again, welcome everyone to our quarterly update. I will now briefly discuss our KPI specific Q1 figures and our strong cash position. Additionally, I would like to first reiterate Eli's comments on our success during the quarter drawing on our differentiated model and proactive strategies to generate record results. On slide seven, I would like to highlight several KPIs that are reflective of our outstanding financial performance, including strong cash generation and the continued deleveraging of our balance sheet. We continue to benefit from our asset light model as well as our prioritization of a better paying cargo mix and initiatives capitalize on the e-commerce boom while providing our customers with the best service, which allowed us to earn premium rates compared to the average of the market. This was critical to drive our record results as the average freight rate per TU rose by 76% in Q1 2021 to 1925 dollars per TU compared to $1,091 in the comparable quarter in 2020, and 27% higher than the average freight rates of $1,518 in Q4 2020. Regarding our balance sheet, we significantly increased our cash position, which I will discuss shortly. Our shareholder equity today is of $1.1 billion. Total outstanding debt in the first quarter increased by $302 million, resulting from a net increase of $389 million related to lease liabilities, almost entirely reflecting us successfully fixing additional long-term charters in the quarter of a very tight market. That is partially offset by a net decrease in financial debt, mainly related to the early repayment of Charge C that we already made uh, in March. We also continue to improve our leverage ratio, which decreased to 0.5. Our free cash flow totaled $643 million compared to $390 million in Q4 2020. That represents a 64% increase. Moving on to slide eight, our ability to take advantage of changing market conditions continues to prove effective and is clearly evidenced by the year-over-year -year improvement in our financial metrics. Looking at our top line, total revenues in the first quarter were $1.7 billion, compared to $823 million in Q1 2020, a 112% increase. Even more importantly, we grew profitably, successfully promoting better paying cargo as we continuously seek to prioritize profitability over mere additional volume and market share. Net profit was a record $590 million in the first quarter compared to a $12 million loss in Q1 2020. Adjusted EBITDA in the first quarter also significantly increased to $821 million compared to $97 million in Q1 2020. Adjusted EBIT increased to $688 million in the first quarter compared to $27 million in the comparable quarter in 2020. Nazeli already mentioned, these results were an all-time high and well above the implied guidance range that we provided in March. Importantly, consistent with our strategic focus and asset lights approach, Zim's adjusted EBITDA and EBIT margins continue to position us among the top performers of the industry. Q1 2021 EBITDA and EBIT margins stood at 47% and 
and 39% respectively. Our first quarter 2021 results also include increased tax expenses, totaling $54 million. Out of this amount, $34 million uh, relate to deferred tax expenses, i.e. non-cash, mostly related to carry-forward losses previously recognized as assets. And furthermore, in light of our current and expected performance for the full year, we reassessed our entire carry-forward tax losses and we now expect to utilize all of them in 2021. Turning to slide nine, our increased carried volume is a direct result of our proactive efforts to launch new expedited services as a response to identified growth in demand and our enhanced position in the Pacific trade. It is especially noticeable given the seasonality traditionally associated with Q1 volume due to the Chinese New Year. You can see that our carried volume year over year increased by 28% from 638,000 TEUs in the first quarter of last year up to, to 818,000 TEUs in the current quarter. Though it should be noted that Q1 2020 volumes were already negatively impacted by the then emerging pandemic. This was driven primarily by growth in the intra-Asia and Pacific trades. Compared to the fourth quarter of 2020, our volume increased by 2%, with our expanded presence in intra-Asia contributing most significantly to the increase. For the full year, we now anticipate carried volume growth of circa 30% as compared to 2020, whereas the industry is expected to grow by 4-5%. Consequently, given our growth expectations and in light of the current congested market and limited availability of containers, we contracted for $588 million of equipment to be delivered during the year. Containers in the amount of $104 million were already delivered the first quarter. Based on our robust cash flow, we made the student capital allocation decision to purchase this equipment out of cash rather than rely on more expensive leasing solutions. Moving on to slide 10, regarding our cash generation, we started 2021 with a consolidated cash position of $570 million. During the quarter, our adjusted EBITDA stood at $821 million, taking into account the decrease of $50 million of working capital and other, $134 million of investing cash flow, $224 million of debt service, we finished the quarter with $983 million of cash, excluding IPO proceeds, and including IPO proceeds, we ended the quarter with $1.2 billion. Now I will review the strong market fundamentals that we continue to see in the liner sector and our positive view going forward. Moving to slide 11, on this slide we show that market supply demand fundamentals remain very positive. In terms of supply, even taking into account the recent ordering, the order book is still historically low. Combined with strong demand, these dynamics have elevated both charter hire and freight rates. Specifically, while new buildings on order, including those recently placed by carriers, have risen to 17% of the total deployed capacity, this is still a significantly lower level versus prior years. Due to the lead time for vessels new building, we have quite a firm outlook on the supply forecast moving forward. Though the order book grew from its lowest level of 8% back in October 2020, we do continue to view supply, dem supply demand fundamentals as favorable particularly given demand growth expectations. Based on an upwardly revised forecast in April, the IMF now projects that the global economy will grow by 6% in 2021. The low order book combined with robust demand has resulted in higher freight rates, which in turn have also allowed for increased charter higher rates as shipping companies are seeking to secure tonnage. 
Moving on to slide 12, supportive of sustained market strength, demand is expected to surpass supply growth during 2021, according to Drury. Their port handling forecast suggests 8.7% and 4.7% growth for 2021 and 2022, respectively. This translates into a positive supply-demand picture, as seen in the chart on the right side of slide 12. Drury expects its supply-demand index to strengthen to 104.8 in 2021, due to increased port congestion and an expected demand bounce in excess of nominal fleet capacity growth. This reflects GDP forecasts that are more optimistic than three months ago, with the exception that consumer demand, sorry, with the expectation that consumer demand for durable goods will remain strong. There is also the possibility of further demand growth as widespread vaccine rollouts continue globally. And in this upside scenario, Brewery anticipates a possible stronger boost to the consumer and company's confidence, and its world port handling forecast for 2021 would then rise to a 10% growth. Turning to the next slide, freight rates are well above the past decade average with little indication of a reversal in the near term. Rising charter hire trends are correlated with demand, as is also reflected in high spot rates. Our long-term contract negotiations highlight elevated demand for capacity and the particular strengths we saw in rates more recently. Even as we expanded our presence in the Trans-Pacific with the launch of new lines, we had to limit volume commitments due to the higher demand, despite our higher volume offering. The long-term contracts, which took effect starting May the 1st, reflect an average rate increase of slightly above 50% when compared to 2020. With equipment shortages and the port congestion persistent, we see freight rates remaining elevated through 2021. While vaccine rollouts should ease labor and productivity issues at ports, we expect nevertheless continued challenges related to handling more volume. On the next slide, slide 14, we address inventory and bunker prices. Retailers' inventory levels remain at their lowest in 20 years, 28 years. We expect retailers to target the same inventory to sales ratio they had prior to the pandemic. Inventory levels have not yet been rebuilt despite the booming demand. In terms of the impact on container demand, we continue to expect import growth for the entirety of 2021 to remain elevated compared to 2020, simply to rebuild inventories. A typical development in sales in the United States could, through inventory replenishment, sustain strong import container growth for the whole of 2021. Turning to the right side of the slide, the price of oil increased with expectations of a fuel demand recovery in the U.S. and Europe as lockdowns ease and economic activity picks back up. And we assumed slightly higher bunker prices when providing our current guidance as compared to our assumptions earlier this year. Turning to uh, our full year outlook of slide 15, as previously mentioned, based on our strong results, positive market view, and the execution of uh, long-term contracts with customers under improved terms comparing to 2020, we now expect to deliver adjusted EBITDA within a range of between $2.5 billion to $2.8 billion, and adjusted EBIT within a range from $1.85 billion to $2.15 billion. The underlying assumptions driving this improved outlook include expected higher average freight rates and charter costs, as well as slightly higher volume and bunker rates as compared to our expectations and assumptions that prevailed when we provided our initial guidance in March. We already updated that our board approved a $2 per share special dividend, and we are also reconfirming our intention to distribute between 30 to 50% of 2021 net profits to shareholders in 2022, subject to board approval. 
And now I will uh, hand uh, over back to Eli for concluding remarks. Thank you, Xavier. Turning to slide 17, we continue our path forward, enjoying significant momentum. I am extremely proud of our strong execution and significant accomplishment in just a few months since going public. As we continue to steam ahead, we'll further position Zim as an innovative digital leader of seaborne transportation and logistic services. We will advance our differentiated model and draw on our strong foundation of talented professionals, our culture of innovation, and our sustainability value to successfully operate in the 21st century. We will also maintain a relentless focus on fueling Zim's growth, maximizing profitability into the future, and creating long-term value. We will now open the call to your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we will begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star, followed by one on their touchdown telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star followed by two. If you are using speaker equipment today, please lift the handset before making your selections. Anyone who has a question may press star followed by one at this time. One moment for the first question, please. The first question is from the line of Randy Givens with Jeffries. Please go ahead. Howdy, gentlemen. How's it going? Very well, thank, thank you, Randy. Randy. The, very well indeed, yes. Uh, congrats, obviously, on the, the record and an epic quarter here. Um, can you talk about first the decision to declare the special dividend and how you decided on the $2 per share amount? And then also with the rising rates that we've been seeing, any reason why 2Q results would not exceed the, the results we've seen here in 1Q? And if improved, what are those additional plans for that free cash, more special dividends or more aggressive debt repayments? Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Randy I will uh, maybe uh, start uh, uh, tackling your first question. The, the special dividend, you may remember that uh, during the IPO, we uh, communicated on our initial dividend policy, which was from 0 to 50 percent. And we also did mention that uh, we were limited by the indenture, by the documentation of the notes in our ability to distribute uh, a dividend or uh, uh, distribute results or profits that we dated 2021. With the uh, very strong first quarter that uh, we are delivering now uh, and the uh, further testing of the uh, cash sweep close as part of the indenture, we announced the full repayment of Tranche C and D far uh, earlier than when we, what we initially anticipated. And that basically freed us uh, completely from any restrictions with respect to uh, dividend, dividend payment. And so also combined with uh, not only a strong first quarter, but uh, a revised guidance in terms of uh, outlook for 2021, which uh, we've increased significantly by uh, 70 to 80 percent compared to uh, last time we, uh, we addressed uh, uh, you, uh, we, uh, we feel comfortable that uh, there is no reason for us not to start distributing in 2021, as opposed to waiting, uh, uh, as we initially said, in uh, 2020. So today, the uh, $2 uh, per, uh, per share, we uh, believe, represent a, a good remuneration to, uh, to our shareholders that uh, are interested in. Uh, look, uh, addressing your second question, uh, when it comes to the uh, improved uh, to the improved uh, guidance, we uh, we uh, we are very pleased with the uh, with the market conditions. We are very pleased with uh, uh, us being able to uh, to uh, uh, increase our guidance for the full year of 2021. Nevertheless, from a dividend policy perspective, we are not changing uh, as of today the, our dividend policy, which is. Uh, Still, I want to re-emphasize uh, that we intend to pay between 30 to 50 percent one profits uh, into 2022, uh, 20, uh, and uh, that uh, should come in uh, early of uh, 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 months of next year. Got it. Okay. 
And then you mentioned the improved pricing on your contracts. Uh, I think you said around 50% improvement. Can you provide an update on how much of your business is on those, you know, one year or so contracts following the contracting period in April and May? Trying to get a sense for, you know, percentage of volumes, maybe duration, if they are all for 12 months or maybe some longer. And then ideally uh, an average contracted TEU rate for the coming year. Uh, Clearly, the backlog has improved based on your increased and relatively tight EBITDA guidance range. The, uh, yes, the, uh, the, the, the percentage of long-term contract, uh, long-term contract very much apply first uh, on the Trans-Pacific trades, not so much yep. on, the, uh, on the other trades. Huh? And Trans-Pacific trades account for 45% pretty much of our overall uh, uh, you know, volume and contribution. So now we, so when we are focusing on the Trans-Pacific, we continue this year just uh, very much like, like uh, last year, we like the idea to have 50% of our volume on the long-term contract and to still benefit from the spot for the uh, reminder uh, of the 50%. But that has not changed uh, in terms of, um, in terms of uh, volume allocation year over year. So overall, uh, if you apply 50% to uh, 45% of our overall volume from a full company perspective, uh, we are still within 20 to 25 percent of our volume that are subject to a long-term contract. When it comes to the rates, uh, indeed, uh, we have, uh, and we are very pleased with the uh, outcome of the uh, negotiation we've had with our, with our customers. Uh, we uh, we uh, did mention the 50 percent increase versus last year. If you allow me, I'm not going to say more uh, uh, about this. Uh, uh, providing an information in terms of incremental amount is, um, is something that we're happy to do, not so much to provide the uh, detailed indication as to uh, how much is the average uh, uh, you know, revenue per TU on our uh, contract, uh, contract volume. Okay. And then on the, when you use the term long-term, are those entirely 12 months or do you have some 18, 24 months? It is mainly 12 months. Uh, it is true that we had uh, customers that uh, were willing to discuss, uh, potentially agree with us, a longer-term commitment uh, at uh, the expense of a reduced rate. It is always the same uh, strategy, uh, you know, longer commitment for, for cheaper, in a way. Uh, we uh, were not so keen on, uh, on uh, pushing those uh, discussions forward and uh, quite, uh, quite pleased to uh, limit the commitment to uh, to 12 months, as uh, we are uh, still uh, optimistic for the for the years. Perfect. And then I'll just sneak in one more here quickly. Uh, slide five. Pretty incredible chart here showing your your net cash leverage ratios coming down. Based on our cash flow projections, we could see you being net debt zero right by uh, some point in 2021. Is that a, a target? Do you have any kind of goal, leverage ratios, or net cash, net debt amounts um, by year end? Uh, you, you, you're right. Uh, we are continuing the downward trend in this respect. Uh, do we have an objective to be at net debt zero? The answer is no. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, for us, we wanted to have uh, and to deleverage our balance sheet, and we more than uh, achieved our uh, initial uh-huh. expectations and, uh, and targets. So there is no such thing as, a, as an objective to, uh, to come down to, uh, to zero in, uh, in terms of leverage. Uh, this is, uh, or in terms of net debt, uh, in, in this respect. So, um, so we, are, we are happy where we are. This is more a consequence of the, uh, of the uh, you know, very favorable market conditions that uh, lead to this uh, outcome, as opposed to a, a conscious strategy to keep on pushing it down. The below two, to be honest with you, I think... Uh, uh, we are uh, we are uh, we are more than happy. Sure. Well, hey, thanks so much for that, and glad to know y'all are staying safe over there. I know I've been praying for Israel, peace in the region. So y'all take care. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question comes line of Omar Nocto with Clarkson Securities. Please go ahead. Hi there. Good afternoon, uh, Ellie and Xavier. Um, yeah. You know, seconding that, you know, Randy's thoughts, uh, obviously, on, on the, the, the crisis there, but also wanted to wish you congratulations on another very, very strong quarter. And it sounds like we're going to be repeating the same message here in three months' time. I um, wanted to ask about, you know, the guidance. And obviously, 
you know, the, the 2.5 to 2.8 billion is a huge jump from where you were just a couple of months ago. And obviously since then, we've seen a, a surge in freight rates. And I guess my question is, do you think that your EBITDA guidance for the year, just knowing what you know now, is still somewhat conservative, considering you did 800 million of EBITDA already in the first quarter, which I guess indicates that you, you may potentially reach your guidance sometime within the third quarter. A any thoughts on that? I, I, you know, uh, f first of all, I would very much uh, hope so. Uh, this is a very good situation to be in, uh, to, to be in a position to raise the uh, to raise the, uh, the the full year the full year guidance. Uh, you know, this comes on the back of a, a few uh, a, a oh. few favorable uh, uh, you know elements. First of all, we have yeah. and we enjoy a significant increase in volume. Uh, when we uh, compare ourselves to uh, the rest of our peers, when we compare ourselves quarter over quarter, uh, we uh, we are carrying uh, more than, and we expect to carry more than 30% incremental volume on the back of all the new lines that uh, we've opened and we continue to uh, to open. So that's, I think, one very f strong driver behind the uh, improved guidance. Obviously, the second one is the uh, is the freight level, the freight rates, and if you look and if we look at uh, the SCFI, it is uh, going up. When we initially uh, thought that it would uh, start to gradually uh, uh, decline, we we are seeing the opposite trend, especially relevant on the uh, trade lanes where we do uh, where we do uh, operate. So this is a, a, another very strong very strong uh, uh, driver that explains why we significantly. Uh, upgraded uh, our guidance. And then lastly, there is, uh, and we just talked about it, the uh, uh, finalization of the uh, long-term contract. So we uh, we know uh, that for Q3, Q4, we will uh, benefit even if we uh, were to anticipate a, uh, or, or to be conservative and look uh, 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 at the spot market going a little bit uh, or softening a little bit, the uh, long-term contract is uh, going up and will be on the up quarter of a quarter in Q3 and, uh, and in Q4. So we, um, we, uh, when we come to you, uh, we uh, truly uh, think that uh, the guidance that we are communicating now is uh, well within reach of, uh, of the company. So we uh, are uh, you know, saying it uh, loud and clear that uh, we uh, truly uh, believe that we will deliver on uh, this, uh, uh, this commitment and uh, this, uh, this guidance to you. Whether there is room uh, for upside, you know, we we we, uh, we never know, and time will tell. In terms of forecasting horizon, uh, we have clear visibility into Q2, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, a good visibility of Q3. Q4 mm -hmm. is a little bit uh, more more blurry, but but again, uh, we see uh, we see uh, very strong and resilient market conditions. Thanks, Xavier. That's a, that's a really good color, and and I guess maybe just. Wanted to double check on some of the figures you were you were talking to, to Randy about when it came to the spot versus contract. Um, just so I have it right, about half of the Trans Pacific business is on contract, and then outside of Trans Pacific, it's primarily spot based. And yes, and so if, yep. And then so if we look at it from just Zim overall, um, if the Trans Pacific's about forty percent of the overall business, then effectively eighty percent of your business over the next 12 months is still open to the the prevailing spot market. That that's that's pretty correct. Uh, with the caveat that on the Asia Med, uh, uh, which would present 20% of our volume, you have another 20 to 30% of uh, uh, we don't say long-term contract, but it's not really spot. It's quarterly uh, quarterly pricing. Got it. Okay. Uh, and then just sorry, one final one for me. You, you mentioned, you know, the 588 million that you've invested or you're planning to invest, you know, for, for this year on new equipment, uh, primarily containers. Um, you also recently contracted, you know, those 10 uh, dual fuel new buildings. What are your thoughts on, you know, do you, do you feel comfortable with the existing fleet capacity? Um, uh, uh, do you see a need to go into the new building market for more ships or are you happy with how things are at this point? Well, uh, from, an, from a container, from an equipment perspective, it was very important to us to continue to, uh, you know, bring in uh, new containers as we are growing uh, quite a significantly quarter over quarter. So uh, we uh, we took uh, uh, the initiative to uh, order equipment quite a while ago, and we started that uh, into uh, you know to the third quarter of uh, of last year already. 
and, the, and we are continuing aggressively to, uh, to bring in additional equipment. When it comes to vessels, uh, we are uh, happy to continue to charter in a capacity as opposed to uh, go and, uh, and buy and order uh, vessels and ships. We did, uh, as uh, you know, we did um, uh, secure the long-term charter for the uh, large capacity vessels that we expect to take delivery from in uh, uh, 2023 to replace the uh, 10,000 TU vessels that we are currently deploying on the, our Asia US East Coast. So we are very uh, pleased uh, to have uh, concluded uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, partnering agreement with, um, with the C-SPAN in, uh, in February. Uh, and then now we will continue to bring in vessels uh, as we uh, need in order to cater for the new lines that uh, we are opening and or to renew uh, existing charter that come to, uh, to, uh, to a renewal date. But uh, we are not uh, uh, challenging our strategy, which is to, re to continue to rely on the charter market. Uh, and then the, what may change and what is changing is the allocation of short-term charter versus longer-term charter due to the current market conditions, obviously. Yeah, got it. All right, well, thank, thanks, Xavier. Uh, appreciate that, and uh, congratulations again. Thank you, Omar. The next question comes to line of Alexia Dogani with Barclays. Please go ahead. Yeah, good afternoon. Thanks for taking my questions, and uh, well done on navigating so successfully such a volatile environment. I just have... Um, Three questions, please. Just firstly, um, just b building on a, on a bit of the um, previous questions, in terms of kind of size of the business now, I mean, clearly you've talked about 112 vessels. Um, do you think we will end the year at a higher number? And um, what do you feel uh, is the right number to kind of um, – run the business with um, the current contracted volumes and the way the market is growing. Um, then secondly, just to kind of tie up on the CAPEX for the full year, am I correct in thinking that CAPEX now will be 488 million for the full year instead of 300 previously? Um, then just thirdly, when you think about um, following kind of this period of extreme volatility uh, because of disruption and increased demand, what do you feel is the normalized earnings power of Zim post-pandemic? I mean, do you feel you can sustain this level of uh, margins uh, going forward because you've built your market share? Um, just a bit of of color to that, that would be great. And then just finally on the order book, obviously it's still quite low, um, but it's been moving quite a bit recently. At what point do you start worrying about supply demand balance further out? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Alexa. I, I'll, uh, I will uh, try to uh, take one after the, the other. Uh, so starting with your first question uh, with respect to the number of vessels, we don't have a number of vessels in mind that we think is, the, is appropriate for us. Uh, quite the contrary, we see vessels as a means to an end. We look at the trade lanes where we think we can uh, provide a uh, competitive uh, proposition and, uh, and grow profitably. That's, that's the driver. And, and we've been engaging very heavily and since already three quarters now on the uh, e-commerce trade, uh, starting between Asia to the U.S., doubling and tripling the, uh, the trade lanes, and also complementing a uh, similar type of trade lanes between uh, Asia to, uh, to, to Australia. And we've been quite successful at it, and uh, hence we grew uh, our fleet and continue to, uh, to grow our fleet. We are also, uh, we are also expanding, uh, as we uh, mentioned with uh, our partners, with the 2M on our historical uh, uh, trades, uh, Asia to the, uh, to the U.S., to name one. So that's the driver for us is not a number of vessels. It's really for as long as uh, we can go and stay in trades that are profitable, we will go in those trades and we will stay in those trades. If not, we will potentially exit. So uh, I guess I hope that answers uh, your first uh, question, question. We are at uh, 112, uh, 112 vessels today. We might as well finish the year at 130 uh, or at 100. Uh, uh, at 100. This, is, uh, this will be driven by our analysis of uh, profitability of each of the trades where we do operate. Second, with a question with regards to uh, CapEx, you're right. 
we uh, we are increasing our full year uh, cash capex in a way by uh, using the excess cash that we are generating today uh, in uh, in paying and in investing in uh, new containers as opposed to contracting uh, leases with uh, box uh, box providers. So um, you should consider cash capex of roughly five hundred million dollars or five hundred and fifty million dollars even for the uh, full year of 2021. Uh, uh, largely allocated to uh, to containers. Uh, then your third question with respect to uh, the, the volatility uh, in uh, in our market and what could be uh, normalized uh, earnings. Uh, what uh, do we think can be the uh, the uh, or the earnings power of uh, of Jim? I think what is very important to us. We don't know what the new normal will be. Uh, we don't know. Uh, whether it's going, to, it's going to be drastically different from what it was before, we have uh, 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 views and um, and, uh, and expectations. One, we think that the market has gained in maturity. That is clear to us uh, in terms of capacity management, and that will also resonate for your fourth question. So the market is uh, more disciplined in this respect. So we, uh, we as an industry, have demonstrated that we could uh, navigate uh, certain changes. In, uh, in demand and in market conditions, that's uh, that, that's one. Second, uh, when it comes to uh, the uh, the uh, supply demand dynamics for the uh, few years to come, the uh, expectations and the uh, industry experts' expectations are uh, quite uh, favorable for the uh, liner uh, uh, for the liner operator like uh, like us. So globally, the, we think that. Uh, that will eventually happen. We do. Uh, we do agree that uh, uh, today's uh, circumstances are, are exceptional. Uh, on the back of already a very good uh, uh, 2020, we think that 2021 will obviously be extremely good. We think that 2022, uh, uh, the, the stars continue to be well aligned. What will be the new uh, the new normal normal for the industry remains to be seen. What is important for us is that uh, in terms of uh, positioning Zim vis-à-vis our peers, our, our larger competitors, we continue to, uh, to deliver superior EBIT, uh, EBIT margin. And we uh, do that quarter after quarter. We think that uh, the transformation, the new positioning of a gym within our landscape is delivering results. The agility that we demonstrate is, uh, is paying off. Uh, and then lastly, your, your question with regards to the order book. Yes, it's on the up, but it's on the up from a very low number uh, when uh, we were uh, talking in looking at uh, uh, what the situation was in October uh, last year, not so long ago, it was 8%. This was too low. Let's be clear. It was too low to uh, guarantee the, uh, the, you know, the replacement capex. It was too low as well to uh, uh, cater for the uh, increased uh, demand that is expected for the years to come. Uh, so now we are at 17%. Uh, if I was to commit and say, well, uh, where do we uh, think is the, uh, the threshold above which potentially uh, uh, there would be a risk of uh, overcapacity? Uh, I think below 20%, we are safe. Uh, you know, again, to cater for replacement capacity and to cater for the uh, expected growth in our market. Um, so, 20%, I think, is a is a reasonable uh, reasonable number. Thanks, Javier. And actually, if you don't mind, I'll ask a follow-up on just the future technologies. I mean, there is a little bit of a debate at the moment whether LNG is the right fuel, um, transition fuel to kind of get the industry decarbonized. I mean, clearly yourselves have um, voted with your feet towards kind of LNG. I guess, what what are, what is your view? I mean, do you feel that it's good enough and therefore that's where you've decided to, um, well, to target your future uh, requirements. Um, just any color on, on, on what kind of the industry is discussing at the moment would be helpful. Sure. Uh, no, we don't think that uh, LNG is uh, going to be the uh, long-lasting technology that will allow for the industry to fully carbonate. Uh, LNG uh, solves and addresses uh, a, a few uh, emission uh, issues but doesn't address uh, CO2 emissions. It is more CO2 friendly, if I can put it that way, than, uh, uh, than the uh, heavy fuel oil or, or, or uh, LSFO. 
but uh, but it is not the long term solution. But it is the best solution that is available today, uh, in terms of scalability, in terms of access. When uh, so when uh, we uh, had to make the decision to uh, enter into this long term uh, uh, agreement with CISPAN, for us it was a no brainer. Uh, we didn't want to buy because we don't think that it is going to be uh, in the, the LNG technology might eventually or will most likely be replaced with uh, an alternative technology, be it ammonia, be it hydrogen, that will uh, uh, solve the, uh, the, the CO2 emission question. So we didn't want to buy and we didn't want to take any residual value risk on the, uh, on the vessel. Nevertheless, we were willing to, uh, to uh, commit to a long-term charter and uh, to use the best available technology of today, which uh, is clearly LNG. There is no better viable technology today than this. So that's our stance. We are not a vessel owner, uh, and we are happy to remain uh, uh, like this uh, predominantly. And, uh, and again, when we uh, just uh, uh, negotiated with CISPAN, we wanted CISPAN to, to make the, uh, the most environmentally friendly uh, choice when it came to serving uh, ZIM. Uh, and in turn, allowing us to to serve our customers uh, in the in the most efficient manner from a carbon intensity perspective. Understood. Thank you very much. This concludes our Q and A for today. I hand back to Ellie Glickman, CEO, for closing comments. Thank you, Operator. I would like to thank everyone again for joining us today's call and for your interest in Zim. We look forward to sharing an update on your progress with you, with you in the future. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Ladies and gentlemen, the conference is now concluded, and you may disconnect your telephone. Thank you for joining, and have a pleasant day. Goodbye.